Uh, well, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to um, be moderating this panel today, um, closing out Women's History Month um, in March. And I actually, um, you know, I wish we were actually in person um, today, but we're not. But if we were, um, I would actually ask everyone um, to raise your hand if you ever shared your Uber ride with someone just to make sure that you got home okay. Um, or raise your hand if you've ever had to pay more for safe transportation options. Have you actually decide, ever decided, you know what, I think it'll be okay if I, if I take this mode and then tried to take it and decided in the middle of the process, you know what, I just don't think I feel safe and had to make a change. Many of you have probably been the only woman in the room and didn't contribute because your idea or perspective was so different from everyone else. And I'd say, raise your hand if you ever left the meeting and kind of kicked yourself for not contributing and vowed up to speak the next time. All of us have been there. And it's because of all of you and everyone on this call and everyone profiled in this book, um, the individual and the collective actions of all the women in our community that show that not only are each and every one of us, um, do we each have a valid perspective, but that our perspectives are also valuable. I wanna actually quote one thing from um, Governor Whitmer's foreword in the book, which I just love. Um, and I'm just gonna read the sentence here. Um, and she said, together, we've become adept at taking sentiments meant to undermine, trivialize or dismiss, and instead use them to motivate, inspire, and to drive the change we want to see in the world. We are all that woman from Michigan at some point. And I could not agree more. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce the two authors of Women Driven Mobility, Caitlin Davis and Kristen Shaw. As a way of introduction, Caitlin Davis has spent her career working alongside automakers, startups, venture capitalists, community organizations, and government bodies to develop better ways to move people, goods, and services. She currently serves as the communications lead for Cavenu, a leading developer for connected roadway technology and ITS America member. And Kristen Shaw is an award-winning marketing and communications professional. In her current role as communications and public involvement corner at WSP, another ITS America member, she is responsible for outreach and public involvement efforts on a number of transportation and infrastructure projects across the US. In her free time, she also owns a photography business, Kristen Shaw Photography. Um, so welcome, Caitlin and Kristen. Um, so we're excited to have you here today. Um, actually, I have my copy of the book right here, which I want to show, which I really enjoyed um, reading. I actually, you know, read it on, on some travel that I've had over the past few weeks. Really enjoyed hearing the stories. So my first basic question for you is um, what inspired you both, um, you know, to write the book? And, and why do you think there's such a need to tell the stories of women leaders in this space right now? Um, so I will pose it to both of you. Um, so whoever wants to go first. Uh, I'll kick things off. So I think what inspired us to write this book and inspired us to keep pushing these conversations is because Kristen and I, you know, have been in this industry for so long and have seen firsthand how women are not always recognized for the good work that they're doing. Um, they're not the people getting invited to speak at events. They're not the people that are getting interviewed by media. They're not necessarily the people who are getting whatever that proverbial seat at the table is. And so how can we help be a part of that? And as to uh, communications storytellers in this industry, we sort of felt like it was our duty to help build this stage, build this table that we can uh, invite people to take a seat at uh, and start these conversations around good work that's happening, um, why it's important to have these diverse viewpoints at the table, and then also just being able to highlight work that is otherwise not getting a lot of attention uh, in the, the broader story of mobility. Yeah, and to add on to that, we also were kind of focused on how so much of the conversations we have with women, whether they're women that we have been, you know, lucky to be mentored by or people entering the industry itself. So much of the conversation is around kind of this, um, like the breaking of the glass ceiling when we really all know that 
you know, we wake up every day and we go to work and we spend, you know, eight hours working on projects and working on things that we are so proud of, but so much of the noise and the conversation in the space is kind of about that, like making room and, and exactly what we're going to be talking about today. And I think one of the big things that Caitlin and I were focused on throughout this entire process was making sure that the work that we are also proud of and that we want to leave as a legacy is really what we're forging through with rather than kind of this empowerment dialogue, which is so important, you know, and it's how we kind of all get through it together. But understanding that the industry, um, it really also does need that showcase of work. And so by by being able to kind of bring all of these stories together in one collective story, I think we, we really were able to organize something that's very strong. And it shows that we're able to kind of do two things at once and be master multitaskers and, and continue to make progress, but also continue to make really um, large leaps and bounds in our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Um... You know, multitasking is is one of the skills that that I think we as women are very good at, and I think, um, you know, it, this this book was very powerful for me. I think it was for many women in this space, um, and you know, just really, really want to just extend my personal appreciation um, for you both um, going forward with this and, and really showcasing these stories. Um, so you know, every time you do something, you learn something new. And, um, and, and I'm sure I know you talked to many, many different women and heard a lot of really interesting stories. So it's probably hard to choose something that stands out, but I did want to ask you both just from your own perspectives, you know, um, you know, was there something that you learned from this experience that surprised you? Um, or was there something that really just stuck out as, as the most striking, um, thing from this into this experience of, of writing this book? I think one thing that I don't think it's necessarily something that we learn, but something that became ever so more apparent, very striking fact is how supportive women are in this industry to other women in this industry. Um, so when, when Kristen and I kicked off the book writing process, we turned to LinkedIn and social media to crowdsource case studies, like introduce us to women who are doing great work, tell us about their projects. And within the first 24, 48 hours, we had gotten hundreds of comments, messages, uh, introductions to other women, uh, people sharing other people's work with us, people they have never even necessarily worked with, but just had met and knew. And it was great. It was this huge sense of community. But most of those referrals, most of those nominations and introductions were coming from other women. Nearly all of them were coming from other women. And so it was very interesting to see this experiment sort of playing out so publicly on on a network that you know is is used by both genders, but to really only see um, support coming from female colleagues was really interesting. I think one of the things that we were very active in throughout this was making sure that we were um, we're capturing a diverse representation of all of the different um, people that make up this industry and then also like the different pillars of the industry. And so one of the things throughout the book that we were really intentional on was making sure that we didn't just talk about um, personal vehicles. We didn't just talk about transit. We just didn't talk about bikes or what, you know, what's going on in the skies. It was kind of making sure that the book did a good job of it, like kind of intertwining all of those into one bigger industry. Um, but then also making sure that we had a really good representation uh, across um, different, you know, stages of the careers, different um, ethnicities and races and just completely different experiences. And it was um, it was definitely an intentional effort. And I think it was a little defeating at times um, for myself and Caitlin when we were having these conversations with women that were either referred to or that we just found from a little bit of like a head hunting to have these conversations and then finally find somebody who we said, you know, this is going to broaden the spectrum of what we're talking about. And then to have to almost convince them to participate um, was something that we saw time and time again. And um, it definitely was a challenge. And I think that credibility, that personal accountability for how important the work is and how valuable it was, was for me, it was a little bit defeating to have that conversation and to have it more than once with, um, women who were doing really, really incredible work and to kind of remind them that their stories were important enough to have this level of attention on them. Um, so I think that was something that stood out to me and then kind of to follow that, just 
the intersection of all of the different types of stories and topics in the book and how they they really resonate to a larger like the really big picture and of how we have to be more intentional all the way across the board or otherwise things will continue to be left out and I think the fact that that was kind of what we started with is like a thesis for the book and then that, that's kind of where it landed was very rewarding um but it was a, definitely a climb to make it happen and so I think it just really spoke to the challenges that we face day to day in the work that we do yeah absolutely oh god I, I would just I would echo that too so the the book is separated into 11 pillars which are these 11 different areas that all make up mobility and in feedback since the book has come out from all sorts of people who have been been reading the book, I've really appreciated the fact that we sort of broke it down into these 11 different sections and really demonstrated how there's so much more than just engineering and design that goes into this. Um, we have a section on placemaking and how placemaking affects uh, personal mobility. Um, there's a, a section on uh, climate resiliency. And so like really understanding this like broader spectrum of what goes into transit and transportation more holistically. Um, and then sort of detailing what work is being done in each of those spaces. Um, outside of the, the women's perspective in the book, I think people have really enjoyed just sort of taking a step back and looking at other areas that impact how we move on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that's really, you know, that's really important and impactful to me too. Um, as you both know, um, you know, I, I've talked a lot about how transportation is just so central to opportunity, right? To economic opportunity and healthcare and education and, you know, your, your, your social well-being, um, you know, critical goods and services, all of that. It's such a key connector. Um, and so, you know, when, when, we're, when we are um, looking at a, a system, you know, that has been designed mostly by men and, and for men, you know, then you're leaving out a real large percentage of the population um, if women aren't included. And just to, to level set for, for folks listening, um, you know, women make up only about 15% of the transportation workforce as a whole. Um, and so, you know, when you think about it that way, you, re you really realize that, you know, this is not just an HR issue, right? This is about really ensuring that all of these perspectives um, of users of our system and the people who rely on transportation for all of their daily needs are actually being represented in the workforce and helping to produce those outcomes that will serve everybody better. So, um, you know, I absolutely agree with that. And I'm, I'm very glad to, you know, that, that you guys did take that broad um, perspective of the industry. Um, so, you know, Kaylin, you mentioned this briefly that, you know, you got so many um, referrals from women. And so I do have a question for you because, you know, here's a book um, about women in the industry. And so my question is, you know, who is the audience for this book? This is to both of you, of course, right? Um, and um, the follow-up to that is, you know, what has the reaction from men been that, that has been shared with you? Yeah, Kristen, do you want to talk about audience? And then I'll grab the, the second half and share yep. some feedback I got this week. Sure. So we really were thinking about the audience from day one that we decided to write a book. We did go back and forth many times to say, what does the cover look like? Does it make sense to have the word women in the title? Who are we writing this for? And one of the things early on that Caitlin and I said was, we have to write this book like men would write this book um, because we wanted it to be for everybody. And so we we made sure that the work really led with that because we wanted anybody to be able to pick it up and say this is valuable. And we didn't want it to be kind of siloed. And so we we thought about it. You know, it could be more technical. It could be a little more narrative. And where we kind of landed was somewhere in the middle. And so the idea is that this book can sit on a shelf in an office. Anybody can pick it up, looking for inspiration in you know one part of kind of what they're working on and feel like, okay, this is possible. This is how we approach it. And so it's definitely more for, for technical for men and women in the space to kind of learn. But then we also did understand that um, for women entering the workforce where maybe it feels a little daunting um, to understand where they fit into a workforce that they don't traditionally, you know, I don't, I hate to say belong, but where they're not represented in right now um, to kind of, you know, hopefully this gets in the hands of some, some women and, and some young men who are considering these as uh, career pathways and then understanding what 
what the future of that can look like. And I think, um, I don't think it's directed either way towards either gender um, because we do need to understand where people fit in as women and as men. And then, in, you know, in between, if they don't identify as either. And so um, I think when we were looking at gender and where it fits into the title of the book and the theme, we really wanted to kind of take a step back in a way that maybe these books haven't been written before. Um, and we did spend a lot of time figuring out what, you know, if it was going to be women with an X or a Y, and, and we just kind of stuck it with women um, for simplicity's sake. But it is definitely written with a tone that anybody could pick it up um, that cares or uses transportation and learn something, um, whether they read it all the way or not. Yeah, and then your second question was around what does feedback look like from, from men since? And I would say this entire process has really been sort of a roller coaster of of emotions and feedback. And um, so when we started the crowdsourcing, that was early 2020, or early pandemics, like March of 2020. And, but as we sort of worked our way through the pandemic and worked our way through the book, I think we started to see uh, attitudes and conversations changing a little bit around gender diversity in this industry. And, one thing that's really stuck out with me, and I've shared this a couple of times with different people over the last couple of days, was I went to an in-person event last week and um, I had a couple men stop me during the networking session that said, hey, I want to talk about your book. And so we actually had like really meaningful conversation. And one gentleman that I was talking to said, you know, I didn't think a lot about some, some ways women, you know, move around during the day that's much different than how I do until I was home with my wife and my family and I saw all the things she was doing outside of just coming to and from work, mm -hmm. um, going to the grocery store, taking kids to school, taking back a lunch that their kid forgot. And so he was like, I, I wasn't really exposed to any of this, so I didn't really see the differences. And he goes, and now being more engaged in some of these conversations around diversity in the workforce, or workplace, he goes, I'm starting to really understand how this has affected the way people travel um, and the way people use these systems. Um, it's very difficult for um, maybe women who are primary caretakers to get strollers in and off of buses or off subways. And, um, and I think before, at least in this person's case, he had never really thought about it that way. And so I think we're starting to see like a societal cultural change coming out of the pandemic that might actually suit this really well. Um, but I also think that just in, um, you know, in the last couple of months conversations I have, people are more ready to engage in these conversations and, and maybe the pandemic and being closer to their families and other people has been an indicator has been uh, an influence on that. I'm not sure. Um, but like I said, it's been a roller coaster and we're, we're starting to, you know, really get great feedback and engagement with people who want to have these conversations. So it's been, it's been good. And I, I think to add on to that, mm -hmm. one of the things that has kind of come from this that has been incredibly refreshing um, is there has been a handful of men who have really loudly supported this. And I think that um, it has created a little bit of a pathway for men to feel comfortable talking about um, where these inequities lie and what they actually look like and then what their role is in that. And so, um, you know, there, you know, we, we have a, a colleague who has said publicly that he's not going to take any more panel positions because he wants to make room for women. And that was one of the most profound things that I've seen somebody take a stance on do. And as like an industry leader who has a lot to say and is fantastic to listen to, just the very active and intentional motion of making room for somebody else was was incredibly impressive to me. And I that that came, I think, while we were writing the book, I don't it definitely didn't follow. Um, but I think that seeing men have those types of conversations and and being vulnerable in a way um it at least has opened i think that door for Caitlin and i to be kind of vehicles for those discussions where men might have been really uncomfortable previously and didn't know like how to talk about it but knew something was kind of weird or off it's been very very refreshing to kind of see who has raised their hand and said i don't know what i'm doing wrong but i want to be better and like just really bringing themselves into this and saying like let's let's do this together it's been very nice to to kind of see the shift in um 
in that willingness to kind of learn and, and unlearn um, how we've been operating. Uh, it's been, I, I hope it just continues to kind of roll on because it's been nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I, I've had I've had men ask me to sort of say, like, I really want to help. What can I do? And I think, you know, it's important, like you're both saying, to create that space for men to genuinely ask um, and then also to be prepared with some answers, right? Whether the mm-hmm. answers are mentor or a woman or, you know, uh, ensure that you won't say that you won't speak on, you know, manals or non-diverse panels or, um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different actions that men can take being an ally, um, you know, to women in their organizations. Um, but creating that space both for them to, to show that they want to help, but they don't know exactly what to do. And then, you know, giving them, um, some concrete actions to take, I think is, is really important. Yeah, um, I think so- understanding also that stepping aside, does that mean that they will be replaced? I think that's probably one of the larger misconceptions is that just because you're pulling up another seat, does it mean you're out? It just means like it just became more comprehensive. And so that's one of the things that's been very nice to kind of see happen um, is that fear kind of go away that we can make room that there's not like a finite number of people who can be involved in something. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say some of the some of the actions that that I've shared with people recently have been around, um, you know, you know, positioning someone else if you're asked for a speaking opportunity and you see that it's all men already on a panel or the the speakers list is not very diverse. Um, another thing is to um, to chair a like internal women's um organization group at your company. And so having, having a male sort of chair and champion it, one usually gets it, especially if, if they're at an executive level, um, gets the, the group, the access that they need inside the company to actually make and achieve some change. Um, and so that's a great way. And also, um, as the chair, you can take that messaging to the rest of the executive committee and help be sort of a champion for um, for the issues or for the initiatives that the organization is trying to achieve. Um, um, you mentioned mentoring a, a women in your organization or externally is also great. Um, getting involved in, in organizations like SWE, especially when you're starting to do like big hiring pushes. Um, you know, go to some of these organizations that aren't necessarily ones that you participate in, um, but attract a different type of um, candidate that would make for a really well-rounded team by working with those types of organizations, getting yourself out of your comfort zone, finding others um, will be really great, you know, whether it's for the product that you're creating, for the community that you're servicing, whatever it is, uh, diverse talent is never a bad thing. Absolutely. Um, well, we're going to continue the conversation, but I do want to invite um, our other two speakers, Kathleen and Gloria, um, to turn on your cameras. I'm going to introduce you. Um, so Kathleen Rooney and Gloria Jaff, um, you know, both um, incredible women um, that, uh, you know, uh, have uh, wonderful stories, which we're going to hear from in just a minute. And let me just introduce them briefly. Um, so Kathleen Rooney is Ulapono's um, lead on transportation related policy and programs in the advancement of cleaner multimodal transportation system in Hawaii that improves people's quality of life. She holds 15 years of national experience in transportation and planning. Um, And we're all jealous that she's in Hawaii and we're not. (laughs) Um, And Gloria Jeff is an experienced transportation executive, professional and urban planner. She's currently with Minnesota DOT, but brings experience from uh, the federal government from Federal Highway, from Michigan DOT, um, LA DOT, and DDOT. Um, so really having a, an extensive experience among all levels of government. She's also the current co-chair of the TRB Committee on Transportation Equity. Um, so Kathleen and Gloria, welcome. We're really excited to have you here today. Um, and I'm going to start, Kathleen, with you. And what I'd like to do is just have you maybe introduce yourself, tell a little bit about your story um, and maybe some of, you know, what's in the book, but also just your own personal transportation story and your experience as a woman in the transportation industry. Sure. Thank you so much. And um, aloha to everybody. Mahalo for having me here today. I feel like I got to do that piece of the shout out, even though I um, was not born and raised here in Hawaii. Um, 
Yeah, no, this is a really exciting venue and I'm really excited to participate in this conversation. So I usually start with a little bit about Ulupono just because it's kind of the way my narrative usually works. So I'm going to default with that if that's okay for today. So you talked a little bit about who we are. We are a Hawaii-based impact investment firm and we're committed to a sustainable, resilient Hawaii. And we do this in a few different sectors. Um, one of which is obviously transportation, since I work in that, but we also do it in local food production, waste and water resources, um, and renewable energy. And um, you might sort of ask, like, well, why transportation? And really, a big part of it is because um, energy in Hawaii as an island community, like many places, is really important, but it's like three times as expensive and it's almost entirely like fossil fuel imported. So we don't, you know, and yet we have lots of wind, we have lots of sun. So, you know, it sort of leaves you in this space, which is like, well, why is that? And if we're talking about self sufficiencies, then importing fuel is just not that great of a strategy at the end of the day. Um, and so that's kind of where um, where I came from. Originally, as an impact investment firm, Ulupona had really been involved in the electric vehicle space, which I don't think would surprise anyone, really, um, given sort of that, that, that phrasing. But it turns out that if you want to really get at some of these issues, electrification of transportation isn't really sufficient, and you really have to get into other types of issues. And uh, they decided they needed someone who understood the policy and planning side of things. And so that's how I came to be in Hawaii was that I was essentially recruited for the position um, by one of my former bosses who was already out here um, and who's one of our stakeholders still to this day. Um, and I think the, the other thing is that transportation is even becoming a bigger, bigger piece of this for Hawaii, both because we obviously have a lot of maritime and air travel that's part of this larger climate conversation. We have really significant climate commitments. We, the state of Hawaii is committed to becoming carbon net neutral um, or positive, depending on who you talk to, um, by 2045. And that's a really big lift. Um, and it requires a lot of changes in our transportation system. And so, you know, I come to this, this perspective. I had started out originally in the environmental space. Um, and then fell into transportation, mostly because a lot of the environmental discussions and climate discussions, even now, sometimes overlook the transportation impacts. I mean, I think it's harder and harder to do, but when I started, you know, 20 years ago, there was sometimes almost very few really discussions about that um, topic. And it's really becoming the largest problem within the climate space. Um, and so that's how I got into transportation, which isn't usually the way a lot of people do it. A lot of times they sort of are coming from the transportation space as a whole. But um, so then I continue to work in transportation, really taking the environmental ethos and goals with me, but not necessarily being super explicit until I got back at Ulupono, which has a very um, sustainability oriented perspective. And it turns out when you're trying to develop an impact investment firm for a small group, we're only about 12, 13 people. Um, you know, and, and you're trying to figure out like what are the investments to make either nonprofit or for profit, um, having this really diverse background in transportation where I've worked from local governments all the way up to several federal agencies. I've worked in about, um, I think 12 to 14 states I can't quite remember what the exact number is and sort of like everything in between. Um, you know, it really does give you this sort of systemic holistic perspective and the ability to kind of apply with that. Um, and I think, you know, the that sort of space, and sorry, I have to like remember what else I was gonna say with my notes. Eight minutes is a decent amount of time to, to fill without like, you know, slides, right? Um, you know, but I think so, coming from that environmental perspective and um, it's just such, I mean, you guys talked about this earlier. It's such an integral part of people's lives in terms of like what we can access, what we can do, how we can do it, how easy is it? And, you know, and, and if we have, a transportation system that has options that are frankly crappy, um, or where you have to spend a minimum of ten thousand dollars a year to sort of fully participate, you know that that's a real problem as a, as a society. Um, and I think like as a as a sort of perspective, and I think when you kind of put all these pieces together, that's the perspective we've taken at Ulupona, which is like transportation isn't an end in its own right; it's derived demand. And I do think this is a big blind spot in our industry. Sometimes we forget like, what is it supposed to do? And I do think the, the book and sort of some of the discussions earlier really do uh, sort of highlight some of that, which is that it's really supposed to be about 
how do we have more meaningful lives through work, through school, through family, through experiences, access to services, all those types of things. And that really the onus on the industry is to how do we provide those opportunities more efficiently with more choices and how to get there. And since, you know, I work a lot in the environmental and sustainability space, how to do that without killing the planet is also, you know, part of our mandate. Um, and that a motto that I've taken with me really early on in my transportation career is that like transportation policy and planning and the system itself is about advancing other community visions and goals. And that's like a real centering thing, which is essentially why we got to this topic of ACEs at Ulupono, right? Um, which is in the autonomous vehicle space, which is um, these same considerations are really important. And, you know, this technology sort of coming down the road, in some places it's already there, right? It, it doesn't have, happen to be ex in Hawaii as much, but, um, you know, I mean, I think like 20 states have autonomous vehicles on the roads right now, um, but that we want to ensure by embracing this technology that it's meeting those other community visions and goals. And, and not just like one solitary community, like many different communities and many different, like I'd like to shout out to the diversity side of things, which is that like when we talk about the community as a monolith, like that's probably not the right way to talk about it. Um, but it's also why when we, we don't talk about autonomous vehicles as much, we talk about ACEs, which is automated, accessible, connected, electric, and shared. Um, and really it's, it's sort of acknowledging that like just the autonomous vehicle technology is not sufficient. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of folks in this on this call and in this space are really have heard about the heaven and hell scenarios, right? The heaven scenario is where all the safety benefits accrue and everybody has greater access. And it's this wonderful sort of utopia. I always joke, it's kind of like living in the Jetsons. Um, you know, that's one version. And then the other one is this hell scenario, which is where you have zombie cars, like hitting people willy nilly. And obviously these are both sort of exaggerations, but I think it sort of shows you that there's a space for deliberate decision making around how we want this technology to manifest itself. And although sometimes we pretend that technology just sort of happens and everybody embraces it and we move on and there's no space for that, there's an incredibly rich history in this country about making decisions around technology and embracing them that we need to start to kind of acknowledge and, and say like, there are real questions here. And, and that's really what our ACEs kind of approach and shout out to Kelly Coiner who helped us develop it. Um, you know, giving credit where credit is due with women in our community. And, you know, I think that's the space that we have been really interested in. And then, and, and how do we craft that? How do you have the conversations around that? How do you get the policy pieces in place? How do we invest in the infrastructure appropriately to bring about these changes? Um, and I think that sort of process also captures a lot of things that I've experienced as a woman, I think in transportation, autonomous vehicles is a space that feels incredibly male dominated. It's, I've actually been really lucky where I've had a lot of women and a very large network of supportive women in transportation. And I suspect some of that's because I'm more on the planning and the policy side. I don't think this is necessarily the same experience that folks have in the operations and the design, definitely not in pavement, as far as I can tell from TRB annual meetings um, and, um, and, and the engineering space, but on the planning and policy and communications, it's a very robust network of women working in these spaces. Um, and, but in, in autonomous vehicles, I'm still the only woman in the room a lot of the time. And I think that's, you know, something to really continue is to pull people into this space and talk about the implications of some of these sort of mobility technologies. Um, I think for women who do feel alone in their spaces, recognize that there are these networks. I mean, the book does a great job at showing women in all different spaces. So even if they're not exactly in your same position, there's a network of women out there who are, you know, available, maybe not all of them all of the time, but they may not be in your discipline and they may not be there. You know, one way to look is sort of nationally, there's a network, but then even in your own communities and in the work you're doing, even if they're not in your agencies, like what's the topic that you can connect with them on that connects to what you're working on. Um, and then the other one is sort of, um, how do you deal with, um, I mean, sexism, for lack of a better term, but I think it's really true of all a lot of the isms, which is that to sort of tell yourself that when it happens, because it will, <laughs> um, and if, if you aren't already experiencing it, like on a daily basis, if you will, um, is that it's not usually like one big flag. There's always a lot of reasons that go along with it. Um, and to not dismiss 
that space. Like they're interconnected. Um, and sometimes they can just be like bad political or good political choices that have a sexist feel to them or a, a disenfranchised feel or a non-inclusive feel and all those sorts of things. But like to be like, just because it's part of the mix doesn't mean that it isn't valid. Um, and I think that's some of the stuff that like, in thinking about this topic and where we're at, like those are some of the observations that I've sort of had and experienced and recognizing that I do, I'm still in a very privileged position during that space, so. And well, I'm at eight minutes, yes. Yeah, thank you, for, <laughs> um, thank you for sharing all that. I will just, I just wanna comment on a few things that you said that, um, you know, really resonate and I'm sure, and Gloria, I know you, you, you're up next and I know that I'm sure that you will have um, some things that probably resonate with what Kathleen said, but, you know, on the sexism front, you know, first of all, I, um, this is not my first rodeo. And, you know, when I was young, starting in my career, I mean, you didn't call it out, right? Like that, the expectation was you didn't call it out. And now we are living in a world where it is expected that that you call it out. Not everybody does, but it's actually more accepted to, for someone to say, like, you no, that's not appropriate. Um, whereas if you've been in the workforce for, you know, more than 20 some years, you, you have, I'm sure experienced it and it was, it was completely accepted. And so I think that's a, um, I'm glad that that's changing, but you're right that we still have a lot of work to do and it still does happen. Um, and then, you know, a couple of things that you said that, that, um, are really important, I think is, you know, when you were talking about transportation, like what is transportation supposed to do? And you talked about advancing community goals. And I think that's a conversation that, um, you know, I hear happening on a national level right now, which is, you know, what, is, what are we doing? What are we building? Are we like, are we building roads and bridges or are we actually building communities? Are we actually trying to, you know, create better lives and better outcomes for people? And, and, and really and truly, it, I think it's a very different way of looking at it when you look at it um, in the latter, right? About you're trying to really build communities. Um, and so I think that's a really important conversation that I'm happy to see happening. Um, and then going hand in hand with that is the application of technology, like you mentioned. And I, I firmly believe, you know, I just America, we represent both the public sector and the private sector. So we represent the companies that are developing a lot of these technologies. Um, and, you know, we firmly believe that there is a responsibility to thoughtful deployment of these technologies and to a policy that will really help achieve the, the goals that we want, um, you know, in the societies that we're deploying them. And, uh, and so I do think those are really important points for, for the industry, um, you know, to be considering. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. We're going to have some, you know, some questions for the group after, but I do want to give Gloria a chance to share a little bit about her story um, you know, her experience, um, some of her work, some of her experience in the industry, um, and, uh, you know, and, and give us her perspective. Good afternoon. This has been a fascinating conversation to listen to. I am indeed privileged to be in this panel group. Let's talk a little bit about my career, and then let me agree, disagree, and hopefully get you to think about some things that you haven't thought about in this dialogue. Um, I've served, as you heard earlier, in executive positions at every level of government and in the private sector um, in a variety of positions and in a variety of geographies. Uh, I've worked in a variety of modes. I've done the highway roads and streets, but I've also done the rail industry, I've also done the transit industry. And so there's this breadth of opportunity. I'm a twofer in the context that I have the mandatory engineering degree that you must have to be considered seriously in transportation, but I also have the planning degree and a policy background. Uh, the question was put to me about how did I become a leader in this space in transportation? And I've got to give credit uh, where credit is due. One is my strong religious beliefs and the idea that I was put on this planet by God to do a specific set of things. Um, a mother who told me from my earliest beginnings, you can be anything you want to be. She came from an environment where education was the key to success. And not just with her, but her parents and her grandparents were also in that same space. I also had a 
personal mentor who helped me to realize that while, educa while education was important and being an educator was important, that I needed to look beyond those places for my positions in the world. And so becoming a leader came from the idea that I could do anything. Now, did it mean that there wouldn't be barriers? Absolutely not. Those of you who know me know the story that um, my godparents lived in a portion of Detroit where interstate construction occurred and they were made three promises. Promise one, we're gonna tear down substandard housing. Promise two, we're gonna replace it with new, better housing. And promise three was it was gonna be affordable. Only two of those three promises got kept. As a youngster, that just struck me as wrong. And so I wanted to figure out how to do something about that. The second thing was, I was and still am very much a sci-fi kind of girl. And I wanted to be an astronaut, but I looked at who were the astronauts and none of them looked like me in any way, shape, form or fashion. And so I figured out, okay, I can still be an astronaut. I'm just gonna have to design a rocket ship that only I can fly. Because if I design one that anybody can fly, um, they'll let anybody but me fly it. So that was the approach toward leadership. But the other task in terms of how did that occur, to be brutally honest, it was the fact that I was very good at whatever tasks were assigned to me, whether it was being a project manager or developing recruitment tools. I was very good at whatever task was assigned to me. But the other piece of it was I was always curious. And so while I made sure I did the very best I could on the tasks that were assigned to me, I was always sort of looking over to see what other folks were working on and be inquisitive and ask questions so that the breadth of my knowledge wasn't limited by the tasks that I was assigned to complete. How I ended up moving into a leadership role was one of the members of the board of the transit agency where I worked had noted my work over the couple of years had noted the commentary around me as a get it done kind of employee. And when some opportunities opened up at the state level and they were specifically looking for uh, people of color, um, my name got entered, I was successful and the career grew from there within the Michigan Department of Transportation. I wasn't looking for an opportunity at the federal level, but lo and behold, again, my work ethic got noted, I got, uh, selected to run policy for Federal Highway. Great couple of things. But let me bring some cautionary notes to the conversation that's taken place. While indeed Kathleen talked about not talking about community as a ubiquitous, don't talk about women in that same way. As an African-American woman, I can tell you that some of the biggest obstacles that I had to overcome were not put in place by men. The, the, the construct seemed to have been, and I'm going to be as generous as I can be, that there were only going to be a certain number of opportunities for women. And women who looked like me didn't deserve them. So other women became my barrier to overcome. And that becomes difficult when you're raised in an environment where it is important that you uplift other women as part of your journey. Yet there they stood. Um, a sterling example of it is within the American Society of Civil Engineers. They actually had to establish two committees, one for women and one for everybody else of disenfranchisement because the women didn't want those issues to be part of the conversation about them. And so that made for a really interesting environment in a professional organization. Um, there were other women who, again, I grew up in the environment where you're supportive. I was accustomed to not only being the only woman in the room, but the only person of color in the room. My life experiences were very different. The, you know, the fellows grew up tinkering with vehicles or in other aspects of engineering or asphalt or design or structures, pick your favorite, whatever. My life experiences were different, not less valid, but simply different. Um, I found it interesting as you, as the authors talked about, the men hadn't thought about. Well, one of the things that 
I find fascinating even in today's environment is that we are very much captured by the natural environment advocates. And as they talk about the importance of having clear skies, as they talk about the importance of being able to have uh, ways to roll and walk, what they don't think about is, is that a conflict? What does safety look like? Is safety simply making sure that a vehicle does not harm you? Or does safety have to do with the fact that those wonderful trees that provide us with that wonderful um, tree-lined street create darkness in spaces? And so as we're busy trying to keep the illumination level down so that we can see the stars at night, who did we just disadvantage? Who bears the burdens in those neighborhoods? While bicycling and walking are important, are they the number one transportation priority for every community, for every neighborhood? While they're important, they may not be. But today, if you say, oh, no, I don't want to do a bikeway. I'd rather spend more money on transit or I'd rather spend more money on sidewalk repair. You are viewed as not being concerned about the climate and the changes that are occurring. It's not an either or, folks. It's an and. So the point of view isn't that my way or no way, but it's let's take a look at all of the different perspectives. And coming to the table as a woman who may be concerned about public transit sounds wonderful, except that the affordable quality daycare may not be in the direction of where I need to go to work. And so this idea of let me abandon my vehicle except for extraordinary trip making occurrences, then what I've just done is reduce my quality time with my family because I now have to do a 30 to 40 minute trip to drop my child off at quality affordable daycare. And my workplace is in a different direction and that represents another hour. And that just takes care of those of us who are privileged. It doesn't deal with the folks who have to maintain two or three um, jobs in order to maintain a quality of life that has to be done. So again, the important thing is as women, we have the ability to multitask and multi-recognize these points of view. And while we may recognize how we've been, been disingenuous, that we really need to do a better job of considering all points of view. And I'm gonna stop talking now because I got my eight minute warning. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. Um, well, and I want to thank you because you 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 bring up a really important point, which is we can't lump excuse me lump all women into one category, um, and I think that's really true. And and uh, I absolutely recognize that. So I want to make sure that that we do honor that because you're right. Everyone's lived per uh, lived experience is different. Um, their perspectives are valid. Um, and I actually want to I want to segue into a question, but I do want to share something that 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 is um relevant to that which is that um one of our members los angeles dot which is run by a woman um they actually did some a study of women's travel needs and they they um did it with three uh three different neighborhoods uh, that were all uh considered disadvantaged but at different levels right um and so and they were different um ethnicities too and you know of course just like you're saying they found really different needs and different challenges among um, the different neighborhoods based on either their um, socioeconomic status and or perhaps um, their ethnicity. And, and so, but one of the interesting things that they found was that some of the most valuable information from that study came from the trips that were not taken, right? So in transportation, we collect a lot of data. And we actually do collect data on, on women's travel patterns and how women move. But we don't seem to be using that data to change services. And, and in addition, in this study in Los Angeles, if we had just collected the data on how women were moving, they wouldn't have found out, for example, that there are women who live five miles from the beach but have never seen the ocean because they can't get there easily. They would have never found out that there are you know, women who have um, sons and daughters in, in, at local colleges in the Los Angeles area 
who never can see them on the weekend because again, they can't easily get to them. And so it was really fascinating um, to hear some of the results of that study. And so my, my question for all of you is, how can we do a better job in creating transportation that is serving um, different communities, different women um, of different you know, races and socioeconomic status better? Um, and is, is that a function of we're not collecting the right data? Or is that more a function of we have the data, but we're not implementing it? I think it's the lens through which we look. We in transportation believe that if we meet the needs of the majority, we've met the needs of the all. And because we are able to collect data that tells us that everybody wants to have differing modes of transportation, they want different choices. So we view that if we give them different choices, that we give everybody all the choices that we could have met all the needs. Mm -hmm. But we don't take into account some of the examples you gave. I'll more critically talk about there are cultures within which um, regular worship is an important element for mm -hmm. not only their religious beliefs, but for the social interactions of those particular cultures. Yet what's the first thing that transit does on the weekends? Reduces the quantity of service because after all, no one's going to work. Mm -hmm. And because we have to make sure that we take care of the work trip, which by the way, represents less than 17% of the daily travel. Exactly, yep. Uh, and we have that data, but we still keep designing roadways and transit systems to satisfy the work trip. We have data that talks about women are much more likely to do trip chaining than men. If one looks at commuting in America, the data's all there, but the lens is, oh, we took care of everybody. So those groups got covered. No, they didn't. Yeah, I mean, everything Gloria said, and then, you know, I think it goes back to the questions that we pose at the beginning. Like, I think that's definitely one piece of it, um, which is what is the transportation supposed to do? It's generally geared around like making it sure you can get to work, right? And 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 that in its own right is a limited perspective. So I think, you know, there's all these other types of trips. Um, you know, the fact that like what LADOT in that study in LA, you know, that it was groundbreaking and that is kind of crazy in its own right, right? Like why do we never ask those questions on the front end or why are they not integrated into you know, large planning activities, right? Like we spend a lot of money, you know, MPOs have to do it every, you know, five years. Like there's a lot of people who plan out there, which I think brings it to the second point. And that's something that I think has become really, like I've seen a lot more lately um, working in this position is that the plans and the policy framework, if you have them that are good, don't necessarily translate to changing decision-making within agencies. Um, and that's a real barrier that I don't think we've really grappled with necessarily, like from the from the industry perspective, which is that, you know, the fact that we're still talking about people complying with ADA 30 years later is just nuts to me. Like how and, and it's still I mean, it happened to me. They blocked access to my daughter's preschool last year during construction. Like this isn't a new law. Like this isn't I mean, and we're still fighting those fights. And I think that. Or just trying to get like that kind of accommodation because anybody who lives on that stretch had to walk in the middle of a two lane highway. You know, I mean, like those types of things. And I think like it's so it's two pieces. Um, I mean, I think the planning space hasn't necessarily pulled all those things together and asked the right questions. But then I think on top of it, that even if you have a decent framework, like we're not seeing it play out on the ground either in a way that's sort of um, uh, transformative and meaningful. It requires a differing mindset than we than the industry has traditionally had. We are so driven by everybody's experience is the same. Yeah. I mean, and I, it I was going to say, right, yeah, when we talk about um, the data and whether the data is complete or how we're applying it, um, I like to think about what we're putting it with, and I think empathy is a huge part of the transportation 
transportation planning process that can be overlooked because it's kind of the soft thing that you're attaching to really, you know, hard and concrete data. And that when you're able to kind of think about it and actually think about the, the end user and what that use case is and then work backwards, um, it can be a little bit more comprehensive. But I think that it's very uncomfortable to kind of associate these these very like emotional and human experiences with these very technical um, projects and these these processes that we're kind of going through. And um, I feel like that conversation is maybe getting a little bit more welcoming to thinking about that that end user um, and starting backwards. And I think that like the listening aspect of these endeavors is probably one of the more important parts. And if you just start with listening, you're going to have, a, I think, a more comprehensive um, product. And I think the data is there, but it can't it can't only be quantitative because we we've, we've seen what that turns into. I think yeah. one of the 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 opportunities that we miss is when we think about not just the end user of the transportation facility or service, but those who are impacted by it. Um, the LA study talked about trips not made. What they didn't look at was in the African American community, there are a boatload of trips not made because if I ride my bike, I'm three times more likely to be stopped by law enforcement than my white male counterpart. Uh, if I walk, you've all seen the national stories where African-American males are simply walking down the street to, a, to get their exercise, to get to a destination where neighbors call and describe them as suspicious characters because they're walking. Talk to anybody at any major institution of higher education where the majority of students are not students of color, how many graduate students majoring in nuclear engineering, for example, got stopped by campus police because they were jogging through campus mm -hmm. because someone reported them as not belonging? That's part of what we don't talk about and don't consider in transportation as we busily talk about the importance of multiple modes of travel. How many trips don't get made for that reason? So while I am in admiration of the work that was done in LA. It didn't look at the total picture, nor did it point folks to say anything other than we've got a problem with women, as opposed to there are a whole bunch of disenfranchised people that we don't know anything about with respect to their trip making. Yeah, one of the things that I think it gets down to across the board is it's none of this can be a one size fits all approach. And I think we understand that from the technical standpoint. So we, we understand that you can't just take a certain kind of road or bus or, and put it in another area because it might not work. But we don't always consider that in terms of who the community and who the riders or who the users are personally. And we have to take that same mindset and say, okay, we can't implement uh, an approach for people to use and assume that they're the same as this community on the other side of the country that it would work really successfully for, it might not work in my city. And we have to do the hard work, like Kristen said, to have some of those conversations and understand um, the more emotional or um, personal side of, of how people are getting about in design, uh, design solutions around that because none of this can be a one-size-fits-all approach. Even within yeah. the same state, it can't even be a one-size-fits-all approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we so we, we are about at time, but there's one question I do wanna just really quickly pose to the group. Um, and the question is, I find myself being the only person and often only female in a work group pointing out that a panel or committee does not have gender or racial diversity. This is not just in my agency, but also with associations and professional groups. My male colleagues never seem to notice and seem surprised, if not a bit annoyed, by my observations. Sadly, this is still very much a thing. How can I, quote, share this burden so it's not always the affected group or person needing to raise the issue? So any quick answers to that question? So, so I immediately uh, smirked when I saw that question come in because this is still happening even in, in my presence and among people who know that I've been very active in this work. I shared with Laura last week, I got invited uh, to an invite only event in which I walked into a room of about 20 men. Um, and, and I immediately called out the organizer, like I walked right up to him. And so I think it, 
it does feel uncomfortable to have those tough conversations. We have to continue to do it. Um, I've asked other, or I've had other people ask me to share feedback with other organizations or with other event organizers. So they're like, I know you're used to having these conversations. Um, but I think we all sort of have to get to the point of, uh, like Kristen said, we wrote this book in a way men would write this book. Men would not shy away from giving their feedback to an event organizer or whoever. So let's do that same thing. Um, let's hold people accountable for diversity and representing this industry the way it should be, um, whether it's gender, whether it's racial, whether it's socioeconomic status, like whatever it is, let's make sure that we continue to challenge people who are holding tables to make sure that they're filling their seats at those tables with a group of people that's very representative of the, the group that they're supposed to represent. I think yes. also just the power of saying no and the willingness to excuse yourself. I think there's a balance there of saying, I, I want to be a part of this. And so I'm going to, you know, kind of be this squeaky wheel. I found myself doing that many times and saying, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to be here and, you know, more people are going to show up. But if you say, you know, something maybe like I'm ready to participate and I want to be a part of this group or this organization, but I'm not going to do that until there's a, you know, another woman here. You know, if you're bringing a value in and you're, you're carrying that, I mean, I think that that can swing a little bit. And I think that it's uncomfortable. I don't, I'm, you know, I don't feel like I, I want to say it's easy to do those things or make those decisions, but um, I think it is, it's eventually that is going to have to be normal. And um, just, I think also just knowing that you're not alone in being kind of that, that only a person being there, you know, I think one of the nice things about this book is it's brought me into a lot of rooms where we are all having these issues. We just don't know where to find them. And then being remote for two years has made it even harder um, because now we're all just dealing with these things actually by ourselves and we don't have that conversation, you know, back to the car or whatever after work. So I think um, also just reach out to other women or, or other people in the industry, because I think we all feel it in one way or another. Um, and it doesn't always feel like an easy conversation to have, but the more I think Caitlin and I have this conversation, the more we're realizing how common it still is and, and how much work we can still do around that. So well, I oh. have one quick one, like, yep. you know, figure out your the platform where you can make change. Like we do a lot of sponsorships as an impact investment firm. So I, I talk to my communications people all the time about making sure that they don't help support panels or we try and influence that in that way. Um, it's not, it doesn't always work. I won't lie. Um, but you know, my communications director knows that this is something that I don't, and not just for me, but for our organization as a whole and, and, and inclusiveness across all of these spaces, you know, Hawaii is very diverse. There's no excuse for us not to have diverse panels. Yeah. I will say in my role as a, a comms and media relations person, I'm all, I'm often having either for the company that I work for now, or when I was at an agency representing several companies, I'm always the one having those conversations around who's going to be doing thought leadership? What are we sponsoring? What are we going to participate in? Um, and so activating your comms person to say, these are the things, these are the rooms we want to be a part of and have them help be sort of a champion. So when you get requests, mm -hmm. so that's one of the first things I do when I get a request, I'm like, I need to see not only the panelists that I'm going to be speaking or someone I'm with my company is going to be speaking with, but I also want to see your full speaker roster so I can vet it for diversity. And I tell them that right up front. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of start that conversation and, and sometimes it goes really well and they're like, yes, we've done really good work and they have breakdowns on everything. And other times they say, it's not that great. And we would love help. If you know someone, or if you know of an organization that can help us with diversity at, with this event, that would be great. Um, and it seems like people are more, um, more open to having those conversations as of late. Thank you, everyone. We are unfortunately just past time. So um, I appreciate everybody's time um, on this webinar. I know we could talk a lot. We may have to do a follow-up um, because we only scratched the surface, but I really appreciate your, um, you know, your thoughts and your candor. Um, really look forward. I urge everybody to go buy the book if you have not already. Um, <laughs> and we will absolutely uh, reconvene and continue this conversation. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Everybody, thank you.